I want us to have prayer for several people before we leave this place. But I want to first share this message that I have on my heart. Most of you are regular attenders here. We have a couple of honored guests with us, but neither one of them is a stranger. But throughout this year, starting during the Christmas season, I've never really done this before in my life, but I have been following a pretty straight line. I preached a lot, talked a lot about the first advent of Christ. What Jesus came to do, what he was sent to do and be. And that is very important. But in the midst of all of that, Jesus did a lot of speaking. Somebody say speaking. And so I've uh, been doing a lot of study on this subject for several years now. As a matter of fact, I'm going to read a scripture to you in a moment that prompted. And I'm not going to have a lot of words right here because I'm going to get into the heart of this message. And again, the notes are outside, so follow along, but you will have access to the notes. I want to talk to you about developing an appreciation for the words of Jesus Christ. John chapter 6, verse 63 most of the scriptures that I'm going to share with you, and I'll let you know when, when it's otherwise, but a lot of the scriptures that I'm going to share with you will not only be about the words of Jesus, but will be the actual words of Jesus. Did we get that? All of them are going to be about the words of Jesus. But a lot of them are going to be his actual words. And this is the case in these two texts. John 6, 63, the words that I speak to you are spirit and they are life. And then a scripture that I shared with you a few weeks ago, as a matter of fact, I preached an entire message on this theme. Matthew 24, 35, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words shall not pass away. Now, if you are a person who is serving the Lord, who is a Christian, if you're a follower of Jesus Christ, then just reading, just hearing those two scriptures should have had a very positive impact on you. Should have gotten your attention and should make you want to know more, to hear more about what Jesus said about his words. Now, I'm going to share a few more scriptures, and these are just to kind of whet your appetite, to pique your interest, because Jesus had a lot to say. And I'll repeat that at some point. Jesus had a lot to say, and he said a lot. And Jesus had a lot to say about his words. And can I just tell you this right here? And let, let's just let our hair down, and let's just enjoy this message and this service. And let's get this thing into our hearts and in our minds, okay? Uh, I like it when people ask me questions. But I had one this morning that I've never been asked before. I've been asked hundreds, and I say that conservatively. But somebody asked me a question this morning and let me know they were listening last week. How long did it take us to get from here to here in this country? In other words, for being one nation under God to a nation where a significant number of our people now say, I don't even believe in God. And I said, well, it took a while. But listen, these are urgent times. And if you've ever been serious about the Lord and the things of the Lord, now is the time. Amen? And the devil hates the truth. He despises the truth. He does not want the pure, unadulterated word of God to be preached. And... What amazes me is in all of the writings and all of the preaching that is done in this country, how little of it pays any attention to or shows due respect and recognition of the preaching and teaching that Jesus did while he was on this earth. That is very troubling. That's all I'm going to say about that. 
Listen to a few more things that Jesus said about his words. And for the sake of time, I'm not going to give you the scripture location because you have the outline. Someone has already gone out and gotten the jump on you. How about that? And if any man hears my words and believes not, I judge him not. Because I can't, I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and who does not receive my words, he has one who will judge him. The word that I have spoken, the same shall judge him at the last day. Now listen, that ought to shock us. That ought to get our attention. Whether we know what he said or not, and for sure if we've heard what he said, and we did not receive it, we did not embrace it, then that will be a factor at the time of judgment. To the Jews who had believed him, Jesus said, if you hold, if you embrace my teaching, you're truly my disciples. All of us would pride ourselves on being Christians, and all of us would pride ourselves as Christians as being disciples of Jesus Christ. Here's a scripture that you've heard a lot of times, but it's amazing how we hear scriptures, we read scriptures, we quote them, but somehow it doesn't get us. If ye abide in me, and if my words abide in you, now I guarantee if I were to stop right there, a lot of you could finish that verse. You can ask what you will, and it shall be done. That's a conditional statement based upon whether or not we abide in him and whether or not his word abides in us. Jesus Christ wants his words to be a part of who we are. Amen? Believest thou not that I'm in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak, the words that I speak unto you. I speak not of myself, but the Father who dwells in me, he doeth the works. This next scripture that I'm going to read to you is a command from Jesus. I've talked to you from time to time about the commands of Jesus. Preached on it. Did a series in the fellowship hall years ago. A handful of you were there. But this is one of the scriptures that touched my heart years ago when I read it. Because I realized Jesus is speaking. And he's given a command to his disciples, to his followers. Take my yoke upon you and learn from, not of me, Learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Jesus actually has commanded his followers, his disciples, to learn from him. Do you know, do you understand that there's a lot, there's a lot that we can learn from him if we will only listen to what he has to say? It is amazing, and of course, Sister Linda would have relate to this, Brother Butch would relate to this, because of the common background that we have. But if you think back to all of the Bible school, the Bible college, seminary, classrooms, lessons, classes, how much were we ever taught about the oral, the verbal ministry of Jesus? Were we ever taught that Jesus functioned as a prophet while he was on this earth? And some of the most profound, significant things in the Bible came from the lips of Jesus. As a matter of fact, the basic fundamental things that we must know, that we need to know to be his disciples, to live for him in this world, came from his lips. You can see why the devil doesn't want people to know that. Amen? Let me say that again because I'm going to take you into some scriptures here. There's a lot that we can learn from the Lord Jesus if we will only listen to him. A few thousand years ago, Moses and the Lord God Almighty had something to say about that. In the book of Deuteronomy chapter 18, the Lord your God, Moses is speaking now. Moses, who is the appointed leader of the children of Israel. And he's speaking to the children of Israel at this point. The Lord your God will raise up for you a prophet like to me from among you, from your fellow Israelites. You must listen to him. That's Moses speaking to the covenant people of God. 
For this is what you ask of the Lord your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly when you said, what he's talking about here is when they got to Mount Sinai and God started to speak, the Lord came down and like a cloud and fire and the, the top of the mountain was on fire and the mountain was quaking and trembling and the people, they heard the voice of God and they said, Moses, tell God to stop talking to us. Tell him to talk to you and you tell us what he said. So this is what Moses is relating to. For this is what you ask of the Lord, your God at Horeb on the day of the assembly, when you said, let us not hear the voice of the Lord, nor see this great fire anymore, or we will die. He's, he continues, though, he says, the Lord said to me, what they say is good. I, now God is speaking here, the Lord God is speaking here, I will raise up for them a prophet like unto you from among your fellow Israelites. And I, God Almighty, the Lord God our Father is speaking here. I will put my words in his mouth. He will tell them everything I command him. I myself will call to account. I myself will call to account anyone who does not listen to my words that the prophet speaks in my name. Did everybody get that? That scripture should grasp us. It should grab us. It should do something to us. Amen? Now, it's interesting that Jesus, of course, acknowledged that he was a prophet. He talked a lot about his oral, uh, his verbal ministry. It was very important to him. But at a point... He makes a statement that just builds right upon this promise and this prophecy that God gave to Israel. You see, Jesus functioned in the role of a prophet while he was engaged in public ministry. And he made an incredibly sobering, significant statement about that. I'm going to give you this location in case you don't pick up the outlines. John chapter 12, verses 49 and 50. This is Jesus speaking about his words. A part of what I read to you a few moments ago came right before this when he talked about the fact that if you don't receive me, if you don't receive my words, I will not judge you, but the words that I have spoken will judge you. On this occasion, he said, I have not spoken of myself, but the Father which sent me, he gave me a commandment, what I should say and what I should speak. And I know that his commandment is life everlasting. Whatsoever I speak, therefore, even as the Father said unto me, so I speak. Is anybody out there getting what I'm saying? I'm telling you, Jesus said this over and over, that my doctrine is not mine. The Father has given them to me. The Father told me what to say. But he didn't even if it didn't happen exactly like that, just the fact that the Son of God, the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us. Grace, uh, the Bible says the law came by Moses, but grace and truth came by Christ Jesus. Amen? As a matter of fact, the scripture I read to you just a moment ago, John chapter 8, verse 31 if you embrace, if you abide in my words, then you are truly my disciple. And the very next word, verse says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall set you free. Listen to what God the Father said to some of Jesus' choice disciples on a very special occasion. Jesus was on the Mount of Transfiguration, and Peter, James, and John were with him. And they had a a vision of Moses and Elijah appearing and communing with Jesus about his upcoming death. And man alive, Peter got all excited. Woo! Oh, Jesus! It's good for us to be here. We need to build three tabernacles. One for Moses, one for Elijah, and one for you. That's the background of what I'm fixing to read to you. Because right in the midst of all of that, the heavenly Father got involved, and he had something to say. After six days, Jesus took with him Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them, and his face shone like the sun, his clothes became white as light, 
Behold, there appeared to them Moses and Elijah talking with him. And Peter said to Jesus, Lord, it's good for us to be here. If you wish, I will make three tents here, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah. He was still speaking. While he's still talking, listen to what happened. Behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and a voice from the cloud said, This is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. Listen to him. How many of you know if we're going to learn from Jesus? We've either got to read what he said or we've got to listen to what he said. How many of you know that? Can I just tell you this? If you, if you, if what I am preaching to you this morning, and I've touched on this for quite some time, but it is so important. It is so significant. If this gets a hold of you, it will revolutionize your walk with the Lord. Amen? I don't use this statement very often. But it will certainly, if there's any such thing as taking you to a higher level, I'll guarantee you it will take you there. To a place that you cannot be otherwise. Listen to what Jesus said to the Father in his high priestly prayer about what he had given to the apostles. I manifested your name to the men whom you've given me out of the world. They were yours, you gave them to me. And they have kept your word. Now they have known that all the things which you've given me are from you. For I have given them the words which you've given them, or which you've given me, and they have received them. I have given unto them the words which you have given unto me, and they have received them. This is kind of like a double dose, you know. The Son of God speaking, but God the Father speaking to us through him. Other biblical characters talk about the, the words of Jesus, about the significance. They have some very insightful, inspiring things to say about the words of Jesus, about the, his oral ministry, his verbal ministry. Let me tell you this, in case you pick up books or you Google things, if you do a lot of reading about discipleship and discipling, you're going to find that people will make a, a very strong point, and they will be smart and wise once they made that strong point, if they just stop right there, and try, instead of trying to create something. But they will tell you that the word disciple is not used in the Bible after Acts 21.16. It's never used in the epistles. That ought to say something. Can I just tell you that everything that the New Testament teaches about disciples and discipleship came through the lips of Jesus Christ. Can I just kind of get a witness out there? Amen. But that doesn't mean that the words of Jesus died. Jesus started something. And could I just tell you this? Jesus started something. And he poured into, he poured in. He, in, he poured himself, his preaching, his teaching, his concepts. What it was all about into those 12 men. Now it didn't take with one of them. But the other 11, they were there till the cows came home. And some of the most critical words that he said to them, he said, as recorded in Matthew chapter 28, beginning of verse 16 through 20. And those fellows, they obeyed what he said, and then they passed it on to the next generation of disciples. We know that based on what Scripture says. Amen. And so we have a record of second generation Christians who have connected with the preaching and the teaching, the oral ministry of Jesus, trying to live out what he said. They want to be true disciples. But there are scriptures that speak in very glowing terms about the words, the doctrine, the preaching, the teaching of Jesus Christ that tell us some things. Remember what Jesus said in Matthew 25, 34. Everybody repeat after me. Matthew 
2435. You got it. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But my words shall not pass away. Jesus used the strongest language available to him to say, I'm telling you something that is absolutely, absolutely impossible. It's not going to happen. My words, my words are perpetual. They are everlasting. Let's read what some of the other scriptures have to say. This is after he has gone to heaven. For I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged and meet together in love to reach all the riches of the full assurance and understanding of the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Didn't I tell you a few moments ago there's a lot to be learned from Jesus? All we have to do, though, is listen to what he had to say. In whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. Is it okay if I just stop for a moment because I, I'm not going to be preaching tonight. We'll talk to you in a moment about tonight's service. But this whole thing of discipling started with some people, and I'm not going to get out into the quagmire and all of this. You didn't come here to be educated, but I do want you to understand a concept, something that is very significant. From the very beginning of this concept, Jesus did start discipling, but he used it. From the very beginning, it was a teacher, a master teacher, a person who possessed incredible knowledge and wisdom, a person who was held in high esteem, a person of influence. And there were people who would want to connect with that teacher. Or he would find people that he felt could handle, that they could receive, comprehend, embrace what he was teaching. Because once he died, once he, he was not able to travel the earth, they didn't have the communication abilities we do today. So he wanted what he believed, the person he was to live on in the lives of other people. So he would pour himself into these people called disciples. And the word disciple means a learner. So you've got a teacher and you've got a disciple who is a learner. But the whole idea, two things, was for that disciple, for his life to be shaped, transformed, for his life to be formed. The person he was, his character, his conduct, to be like his master. And what his master believed, what his master taught, his beliefs, his teachings, his concepts. He was supposed to not only embrace them, but he was to pass them on to somebody else. Are you hearing me? The Jews did the very same thing. Jewish rabbis. They would find someone because they wanted to do the very same thing. The same thing was true with Jesus. Did everybody hear that the same thing was true with Jesus Christ? The Bible says in Mark chapter 3 verse 34, And Jesus chose twelve, and he ordained them to be with him and to follow him. He started off with those twelve guys. And like I told you, one of them dropped out, but the others stayed the course. Could I just tell you this? It didn't take long. It didn't take long when during the lifetime of Jesus, during the lifetime of Jesus, those guys multiplied and actually their, their, their times in the Gospels when, we're, when they talk about the disciples and it talks about multitudes of people who are now following Jesus. Those guys did what they were supposed to do. And could I just tell you this? You and I have this obligation, this responsibility. This is not just something that Benny Gray Mills does. You know, Donna Marguerite, Rhonda Kay, Tammy, whatever the middle name is there. Sue. All of us are supposed to be disciples and learners, but then we're not supposed to just tuck that away. We're supposed to share it. Amen? Do you understand that this is one of the reasons why the Christian church in America is losing ground? 
Amen? I'm telling you that Jesus told us in plain, simple language how to disciple. So, you know, you don't have to go somewhere, you know, and sit somewhere for a, a three-month course or send off and get all the literature and all that. I can tell you in just five minutes. Go ye therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them the first phrase I read to you is a mandate, a command to us. Make disciples. He tells us how. Teaching them. My Lord Jesus, what are we going to teach them? You teach them to observe, to obey what I have commanded you. And this is why I've talked so much about the commandments of Jesus. Jesus gave us a lot of commandments, and I just read two of those to you in a scripture that you're very familiar with. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me. Amen? Take a deep breath. You Boy, you look like you're working so hard. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. Now, I realize I read that from a different translation, but there are... A lot of early and diverse witnesses that indicate that originally that's what the scripture read. Here's a powerful scripture here. Let as many servants as are under the yoke count their own masters worthy of all honor, so that the name of God and his doctrine be not blasphemed. And they that have believed in masters, let them not despise them, but they are brethren, but rather do them service, because they are faithful and beloved partakers of the benefit. These things teach and exhort. Listen to this scripture. If any man teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words, even the words of our Lord Jesus Christ, and to the doctrine which is according to God on us, he is proud, knowing nothing. Paul here refers to the words of Christ, and he refers to them as wholesome words, healthy words. I'll tell you that when you learn what Jesus had to say, and I'm talking here in terms, I'm going to, I'm going to give you a moment that's going to, a number that's going to knock your socks off. I've given it in the presence of some of you and you survive, but others may not. Uh, Jesus had a lot to say and he said it. But our first focus is what Jesus said to his disciples. And then, of course, if you obey, if you listen to what he said to his disciples, and that's going to drive you to every word in the New Testament that is red in color. Now, let me just tell you something. I'm on a mission. I'm on a campaign. And if you don't have a red letter Bible, you'll be doing yourself a big favor to go out and get one before the day is over with. I like the Psalms. I like the Proverbs. I've made reference to both of those books in my preaching and my teaching and printed sermons and otherwise. But listen, if you're saved and if you want to be the kind of Christian that the Lord wants you to be, get a red letter Bible and devour what Jesus had to say. And especially listen when it says he taught his disciples. Jesus spent a, an enormous amount of his time teaching, teaching. Everybody say teaching. Can I just tell you this? I know, hey, I, I, my age is no, um, is no secret. Now, see, these ladies here, I know their age, you know, but they're just kind of hanging on. They've reached a point, and they're not going to age beyond that. I'm just glad to be the age that I am. <laughs> Amen? I know we've reached a point, well, hey, I don't want to learn anything else. I know enough. <laughs> You'll never know too much about God's Word and about our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? And the more you learn, the more you're going to want to learn. As a matter of fact, here is a scripture. I'm giving you scriptures now that didn't come from the mouth of Jesus. But these scriptures are about his words. And this scripture is a command. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly. That is a scripture written by the apostle Paul under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit to the church at Colossae. John had some cautions for his fellow believers. He said, anyone who runs ahead and does not, con 
who does not continue or persist in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever continues in the teaching has both the Father and the Son. Now, the average Christian, when they think about the ministry of Jesus, they think about him touching the, the blind man's eyes, or him walking on the water and then feeding the 5,000, of him casting demons out. And all of those things happened. But when you mention the ministry of Jesus, few people, unless they're really, really into the word, few people think immediately about the preaching and teaching ministry of Jesus. Early, in the earliest days of his ministry, Jesus set the record straight. Listen to what he said. And Jesus, being full of the Holy Ghost, returned from Jordan, and was led by the Spirit in the wilderness, being tempted of the devil forty days. And when the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a season. And Jesus returned to the power of the Spirit into Galilee, and there went out a fame of him throughout all the region round about, and he taught in their synagogues, being glorified of all. And he came to Nazareth. Nazareth was his hometown. They reached a time when he left and set his headquarters in Capernaum. But this is the very beginning of his ministry. He came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. And there was delivered unto him the book of the prophet Isaiah. And when he had opened the book, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me. He's reading from Isaiah chapter 61, beginning at verse 1. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because he's anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to preach deliverance to the captives, becoming a sight to the blind, to set at liberty the that are approved, and to preach the acceptable year of the Lord. He actually mentions his oral ministry more than the other. But what we know is that Jesus spent, busied himself doing both of them. And he talked a lot. I'm not going to get into this this morning, but he talked a lot about his preaching and teaching and about his words. He wanted people to hear what he had to say and to understand the significance of them. Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all manner of sickness and all manner of disease. Remember what I'm doing. I'm trying to develop in you an appreciation so that you will value, you will esteem the words of Jesus. This vital part of his ministry, this thing of using words, was an integral part of who he was and what he did. It came to pass when Jesus had made an end of commanding his twelve disciples, he departed thence to teach and to preach in their cities. It came to pass that on one of those days as he taught the people in the temple and preached the gospel, the priests came unto him with their elders. Preaching and teaching. Could I remind you that teaching is not boring preaching? I've heard a lot of preaching that was boring, and I've heard some teaching that kept me on the edge of my seat. Amen? There is a difference. Do I need to remind you of the difference between preaching and teaching? There's a difference in proclaiming and ex explaining. Amen? I was picking on... Uh, Rosie a few moments ago and I said you ought to be in good form this morning you went to North Carolina yesterday it's no secret Joyce and her husband are both from North Carolina but of course when I talk to people there's several people in Cleveland who are very familiar with North Carolina some of them are from eastern North Carolina so when we talk about going home immediately Immediately, the, the subject of barbecue comes to mind. And that's, you don't have to say what kind of barbecue, you know. It, it's the only real kind, you know. 
So you don't, it's just which one are you going to go to, you know? Seriously, church. Most people will get saved through preaching. But you grow, you mature, you're established through teaching. And so let me ask you, please don't, don't be afraid of learning. And don't sell yourself short. I'm too old to learn. <laughs> are you still breathing? Let me tell you about the word appreciation here for a moment as I bring this message to a close in a few moments here. Appreciation means recognition and enjoyment of the good qualities of someone or something. A full understanding of a situation. Recognition of the quality, the vanity, the significance or the magnitude of a person or a thing. Do you remember how many words I told you that are recorded in the Bible that Jesus spoke? 181,253 words in the New Testament. Jesus spoke 34,450, one out of five words in the New Testament. I was working on a project to download all of those for you. I'm having to back up and punt because it's amazing. That's a lot of space on a computer. Amen? Got up to a hundred pages and <laughs> had just gotten through Matthew. But I want you to read what Jesus had to say, to know what he had to say, amen? But to see the significance of his word is not the magnitude, but the message. And listen to me, listen to me. I've said this several times. And if I can just get my wife motivated here, we may can put this. I've got a lot of handwritten notes. I'm a, I like to make notes. I've got tons of them and paper everywhere. But when it really gets you about the significance of Jesus' words, and you start reading those words, did you know that it were not for Jesus, there's so much that is written in the Bible that we would have no clue because he's the only source. The only source. Let me just give you an example. It is so simple, but it's one you're very familiar with. I did something Wednesday night. It just was different, but we, we had a very good crowd. We sat around the table, and I said, now listen, put your Bible away. Put your devices away. And I'm just going to ask you to recite statements made by Jesus. And so they did a pretty good job. They did. I said, now, I'm not going to put anybody on the spot. But, of course, one person got right into, right into line there. And so this scripture that I'm fixing to share with you, that Jesus revealed. This is one of the first ones this fellow used. In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I'll come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am, there you may be also. That's the only place in the Bible that lets us know that Jesus is doing that for us in heaven right now. We would have no clue. Furthermore, we would not know that we would have a place. We just have to take it by faith and figure out, okay, God the Father knows what he's doing, so we get there, he'll take care of us. But it's amazing the things that Jesus spoke that we need to know that will inspire us, that will inform us. Some of them will instruct us that only came from his lips that are not found anywhere else in the Bible. So, let me just give you three reasons why we should appreciate his word. Source, I talked about that some. Substance, I just kind of gave you an idea there. And of course the scope. Jesus covered the bases. 
And it's been a long time since I said this to you, so let me repeat this. If the only part of the Bible that you had were the words of Jesus, did you know that you would have enough to know what you must know to get in, to get through, and to get out? How about that? So, I want to encourage you to quench yourself with the words of Jesus. I want to whet your spiritual appetite. Jesus, on more than one occasion, reveals spiritual truths and insight that you won't find anywhere else in the Bible. So, you need to read what he said. Let me close with a very significant scripture. Do I have your attention? If for no other reason than what I'm fixing to share with you, I'm going to close this message. This is a very sobering scripture. But how many of you know that this is serious business? We're talking here about eternity. Listen to what Jesus said about his words. And he talks about two kinds of people. One who reacts positively, the other one who is not responsive. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is likened to a wise man who built his house on a rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, yet it did not fall, because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, the wind blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Don't do it just because the preacher said you should. Do it because Jesus said you should. Amen? Remember that we're on a one-way street. And I will tell you this. I've never learned anything about Jesus and about his words that I regretted. Please pick up the notes outside. And let me encourage you. Stay in the word. Amen. Listen to what Jesus said. Father. I pray that you would use the word that has been spoken here today. I pray that you would use these scriptures, Lord God, to challenge your people, to help them, to guide them. I pray, Lord God, that you would use this video, the, the CD, any, any place, anywhere this message ends up, people who will hear it, may it have a positive impact upon their lives. Father, I pray that you would just bless, strengthen, nurture, undergird every person who is in this place, who will watch this video, who will hear the CD. Lord, I pray that you would just undergird and reach them. And I pray, Father, as I do every day for those who are part of this fellowship, that you would strengthen every one of them with might by your Spirit in the inner man. We ask you this, Father, in the mighty name of Jesus. Amen. Let me just.